Okay, we have more than 50 in the audience. Maybe we should begin. How's that? And uh, also, also, I forgot to mention earlier, um, Mary, I know you have a meeting to go at 1.30, well, for our time. So just go, um, oh, yeah. So I um, can, the rest of us, if you don't need to rush, can we stay behind for two minutes just to wind down a little bit? Thank you, thank you, ladies. Wonderful. So um, hello, everybody. Welcome to our um, event, another event for Environment in Asia research series at the Falbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Welcome to participate in this awesome event. My name is Lin Zhang, Zhang Lin in Chinese way. I'm an environmental and economic historian for pre-modern China. I teach at Boston College at the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies. Um, I am a research associate and I am the convener for Environment in Asia research series. So our series have been carrying on for eight years. Every year we um, provide, uh, we organize all kinds of research events ranging from individual standalone talks to uh, fascinating panels like what you're gonna hear and see today and also to workshops, art exhibitions, so please follow us, follow our previous event. To look for our event, you can go to the website, um, to the event section um, at the website Felbank, for Felbank Center. So check us out, so follow us. So here, today we are very fortunate, very lucky to invite four amazing scholars for modern China uh, in regard to Chinese studies, especially related to medicinal studies, um, history of science and history of knowledge and uh, public health studies. So these brilliant scholars happen to be all to be women. And I, we were just told in Felbank Center's hundreds of years long history, ours is the very first event uh, for women panel. So it's the history is right now being made here. So it's a, such a wonderful opportunity to be sitting here with four awesome women scholars. I feel truly honored. So today's event is called Infectious Diseases and Public Health Management in China from both the historical perspective and uh, anthropological perspective. So I'm not going to, I don't want to talk too much about it because our scholars, panelists, they have a wonderful insights to share. I'm just going to reserve most of the, the minutes for them to talk about infectious disease and public health management. Let me very quickly uh, mention the format of the event. So after my very brief introduction, our four scholars panelists will talk about a little bit about their previous research and their current go and ongoing uh, fascinating new research. After that, we will uh, move into the second section of the event. That is, we will uh, bring up several commonly um, interested issues for all our panelists to comment, uh, comment on. That may go through maybe about 30 minutes and we hope to reserve 25, at least 20 minutes for Q&A. So for our audience, if you have a question, you have a comment, any thoughts, um, please leave, type down your thoughts and a question in a Q&A box. So uh, we will make sure, try to cover as question as many questions as possible. All right, uh, let me introduce our speakers, our panelists today. So let's follow the name order. So first we have a Professor Nicole Barn. Nicole Barnes is a assistant professor in the Department of History and Gender, Sexuality, and a Feminist Study at the Duke University. Nicole's first book, Intimate Communities, Wartime Healthcare, and the Birth of Modern China, 1937 to 1945, was published by University of California Press in 2018. And her book received the 2019 Joan Kelly Memorial Prize from the American Historical Association, also the 2020 William H. Welch Medal from the American Association for History of Medicine. So congratulations, Nicole. So what wonderful honor, well-deserved. Uh, Nicole researches history of medicine, women, and gender in 20th century China. 
Next speaker, next panelist, Mary Brazelton, is a senior lecturer in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science of the University of Cambridge. Um, Mary's a new book, Mass Vaccination, which is very timely, <laughs> Citizens of Bodies and State Power in Modern China, was recently published by Cornell University Press in 2019. So everybody, everybody check out. Um, Mary's research interests lies, um, uh, lie broadly in historical intersection of a science, technology, and a medicine in China and around the world. Our third panelist is Professor Miriam Gross. Miriam is an associate professor in the Department of History and also of International and Area Studies at the University of Oklahoma, Norman. Miriam's first is very well known, Farewell to the God of a Plague, Chairman Mao's campaign to deworm China. The book was published by University of California Press in 2016, and many of us have already read it. Miriam's research focuses on the popularization, politicization, and a contestation of science and medicine in the countryside in modern China, as well as China's medical diplomacy abroad. So our fourth panelist is Professor Alana Ukraski. Um, Alana is a associate professor of international and global studies at Brandeis University, and she is a trained medical um, anthropologist. Alana's first book, Occupational Hazards, Sex, Business, and HIV AIDS in Post-Mao uh, post China uh, was published by Stanford University Press also in 2016. It was a brilliant work. So apart from studying the impact of a gender, sexuality, and a governance on HIV and chronic disease in China, um, Alana also has been studying China's increasing involvement in the global health field and has conducted research on the health of African immigrants, migrants living in the city of Guangzhou, which I believe we will hear a lot about today. So welcome, four of you. So I'm going to turn to you. So we will follow the order. So briefly introduce your past and present research. So if, if we are going to go a little bit over time, I will use the chat fun function to um, make a sign noise to you and perhaps gonna also use voice noise to uh, remind you about timing. Can you see my screen now? Fantastic. Okay. Great. So uh, in my first book, Intimate Communities, which uh, Zhang Ning uh, presented, um, I made this case that women provided the medical care that simultaneously healed people and brought them into the national community, the nation as subjects of the state and members of a, a community. Um, and because that work is about women doing a lot of unrecognized labor, I want to also begin by saying, because this is a womanal, um, I stand on the shoulders of all of my female colleagues, particularly the, the women, the brilliant women I'm presenting with alongside today. I have learned so much uh, from each of you. Um, and I wish I could go into more detail about all of that, but I also want to give credit to the Luminos platform and University of California Press because my book is a free download since I, uh, uh, since I received so much money from these entities, I want to thank them for making my book freely available to anyone. And then I just want to share two brief questions that I started this project with. The first was, what happened to Chinese women after the war with Japan began in July 1930? everything I had read, about 90% history in that month and in that year. Um, but we have in Western societies a very uh, easily accessible Rosie the Riveter narrative of what happened to women in, in World War II. Of course, it's highly simplified, but the story in China doesn't start until you get to the island, the Tianyu of the Maoist period. So what's happening in this war era? I wanted to know. 
And the second was, was the war solely a crisis for public health development? That was the narrative when I started this project many, many years ago. Uh, but then one of the very first things I saw in the archive was first this, uh, these two maps of health organizations in China. This first one taken in 1937 or developed in 1937. And you see a few bits of concentration on the East Coast around the Jiangxi Soviet region and Guangdong where both parties are rather strong and then around the Nationalist Party's capital, Nanjing, Shanghai region. Um, but then five years later, during the midst of the war, you have a massive explosion of public health organizations. So this was not a cessation of development. How did this come to be? Because there was a major, major crisis. Sorry, that third slide was not supposed to be there. Um, the government moved twice from Nanjing to Wuhan and then later to Chongqing. They lost their largest public health hospital, the 3,000 bed National Red Cross Hospital, a month after it was built, was occupied by the Japanese and now they were in makeshift situations such as this gymnasium. Uh, the, the soldiers were, especially by the early 1940s, were largely young, untrained, already malnourished, uh, and um, really ill-equipped to, to face the one of the world's most advanced and well-developed militaries at the time. And the, the entire country, and especially the, the wartime capital as shown here, were subject to massive air raids. According to the historian of war, Rana Mitter, Chongqing was the most bombed city in all of China. So who is stepping in to help when in this desperate situation? And it's women. Women doing almost completely uh, unpaid or very, very terribly low paid work. And yet at the same time, it's an opportunity for women's uplift. They're coming to people's homes to do, to deliver babies, to do postnatal care, to do public health work. They're getting on bicycles to do this work. Uh, and they've been trained by the first woman to attain the rank of major general in the National Revolutionary Army, Zhou Meiyu. Um, and I'll, I'll likely mention her in my points later. So remember her name, Zhou Meiyu. She's a really wonderful person, uh, or she was. And um, the, they're using, they're leveraging the power of science to simultaneously be a major part of indigenizing scientific biomedicine in China, but to also grant themselves authority in spaces like a nursing classroom. This is a missionary, this photograph is of a missionary institution, but it's all Chinese faces, including the teacher. Um, and in clinical settings like this hospital where the nurse is the one who holds the patient's records and she has this power, right? She's still working under most likely a male doctor. There were a few female doctors, but mostly it was a gender division within the medical world, um, but she has the authority. Um, so that's a little brief intro into the, the the overall arc of the story in the first book. And I ended that first book with another enduring question, which is, you know, if most Chinese throughout most of, of Chinese history were all or partially illiterate, and yet the field of history, because we as historians are so well trained in written texts, are primarily using the written texts to understand that history, what are we really missing about what people really experienced? So that's a, 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 a major enduring question that I think will drive the remainder of my career. And I hope that it will push the field as a whole, the modern Chinese history field. Um, and then in concrete terms, when we're left in the 1950s with the, the rise of an entirely new state, a Maoist state, there's a question that is provoked in part by images like this that I received from my colleague, Miriam Gross, um, about what is the role that women are, are, how are, how are women partaking in the making of a new state and, and carrying on that legacy of dramatic and shockingly su successful public health development in the midst of a war, now that we have peace and a new state, what, what, what role are women playing? And it is an interesting one. Um, and how are they pushing forward the, the work of public health in many um, unofficial and official capacities and in recognized and unrecognized ways? So that's where we end. And I will stop my share. Thank you, Nicole. Wonderful. Then we will turn to Mary, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. 
right, let me just see if I can. Okay, so thank you for that introduction, uh, Ling. And it's I'm honored to be following uh, one of the several colleagues here who has really helped uh, my own research and work so much. Um, so that's a particular pleasure. My past and current research has really been driven by two major questions. The first is, to what extent or what role has medicine played in relationships between state and society in modern China? Um, I mean, I think we're all probably concerned with that question to one extent or another at this point. But uh, from the very beginning of my uh, studies of modern Chinese history, I was drawn to questions of medicine and public health and especially to vaccination as a bodily intervention that seemed to articulate relationships between state authority, biomedical expertise, and lived experience in modern China in multiple interesting levels and ways. Even as immunization writ large could affect population level changes in mortality or morbid morbidity of infectious diseases, the act of injecting or orally administering a vaccine against smallpox, cholera, or say polio was always specific and individual in a way that really fascinated me. So the result after a lot of time uh, and archival work uh, was uh, my book, as Ling kindly referenced, published by Cornell in 2019, in which uh, I suggested that in 20th century China, the history of mass immunization helps articulate the construction of biotechnological systems of political control in various ways. Mass vaccination against a variety of infectious diseases as a set of people, materials, and systems that supported the production of immunity against these infectious diseases at a population level took shape in China in the mid 20th century, especially during the years of the Second Sino-Japanese War. And so hopefully the connections uh, with the work of others on this panel are very, very clear. These programs were expanded uh, after the Chinese Communist Party consolidated its power uh, in the 1950s, and the control of infectious diseases to which mass vaccination programs contributed offered a powerful justification for China's rural health systems to influence models of primary health care and global health more broadly. So the trend we see is one in which the Republic and then the People's Republic of China asserted increasing responsibility for vaccinating citizens, that responsibility brought the power of the state to bear, binding people into increasingly strong obligations to uh, submit to governmental mandates. At the same time, that responsibility required the establishment of large technological systems of vaccine cultivation, preservation, and distribution. In this way, mass immunization provided a basis for the promotion of commitments to modern science. And that brings me to a second question that uh, has been driving more of my recent research um, and perhaps reflects the fact that I currently occupy a position in a history and philosophy of science department, uh, which is how does the case of China challenge how we think about the history of science more broadly? So studies of science and empire, post-colonial science studies, the global history of science variously have sought to incorporate China in broader efforts to articulate what it might mean to uh, produce or write a history of science that productively and sensitively accounts for geographic, cultural, and linguistic difference. My preference following ideas of Asia as method and East Asian SDS as many others before me have has been to think about the history of science as a way that starts with, with China and East Asia at the center rather than the periphery of scientific inquiry. And recent work on the history of penicillin has proven a useful space in which to pursue some of these questions. So I'm interested in how local innovation in Chinese penicillin production in 1944, so quite early uh, globally, confounded expectations of straightforward technology transfer from the United States. It also, I think, subverted understandings of experimental replication that typically relied on tacit knowledge. So there are interesting things to explore in terms of um, the sociology of scientific knowledge, I think. Other work on the history of transportation technologies, uh, which is a bit newer for me, considers the ways in which attending to the actual means by which people, texts, and objects moved around the world can help articulate and explain the movement of knowledge more broadly, I think. Uh, as well as the more specific ways in which in East Asia, technologies like aviation may have shaped scientific discipline formation. And 
just very briefly, in addition to those current research projects, something else that I've been thinking about um, has been the relationship of history to policy. And I'll mention this in part because I think it is relevant to the discussions that are going to ensue. Uh, so over the summer, I was part of a World Health Organization project seeking to articulate what lessons the history of medicine held for global health administration. And so for me, this was very much a matter of drawing on my experience in modern Chinese history to contribute to these broader discussions in the history of medicine. Um, we concluded, perhaps unsurprisingly, that history uh, could not offer a simple grab bag of case studies from which to draw one size fits all lessons. Uh, what history did offer was a means of analysis of attending to the unintended consequences that complicate the long-term assessment of epidemic control, of calling attention to the need to understand how and why particular narratives of epidemics have gained power and trust, and the need to understand the historically produced structures, inequalities, and frameworks that epidemic response operates in inner trenches. So even though my current research may be taking me a bit further from uh, epidemics and public health, uh, I'm still very much thinking about a lot of these issues uh, on a fairly regular basis. So I'll pause there and uh, move things along to the next uh, presenter. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, let's uh, move on to Miriam. Okay. Whoops. All right. All right. Hi, all of you. It's a, a pleasure to participate in this panel with such um, wonderful, wonderful uh, colleagues, Ling, thank you so much for organizing and moderating it, as well as inviting me to participate. So my work, um, uh, in many ways, like Mary's, is, is motivated by the, the intersection between politics and health. And I use health science and the environment as a lens to understanding shifting state society relations <laughs> from 1949 to now, so very similar. I explore though, um, from a very bottom up perspective, how rural people receive, assimilate, and even sabotage government's health work. How the government then makes its will manifest out in the countryside, despite great decentralization. And also how material scarcity and local ecosystems blend with rural responses to create discrete policies and practices on the ground. Um, my first uh, study, Farewell to the God of Plague, Chairman Mao's campaign to deworm China, explores one of the most famous Maoist era campaigns against the parasitic disease schistosomiasis, Xue Xi Chongbing, or the Xue Fang Yun Dong. Um, when I began this study, most people were flabbergasted. I was told there's nothing to learn about that. The government's methods and successes are extremely well documented. And we all know that it was rural people's vast support and energetic participation which made this campaign work. In fact, it's the model for beloved participation. I didn't doubt that it worked. There's quite credible statistics uh, from before 1949 and in the 1980s that shows a really large drop in the disease. But I did doubt why and how it actually functioned. Uh, how could an unfunded mandate actually follow a government campaign process that required significant resources? Uh, if prevention was so successful, why were they still doing this campaign three decades later? Whoops. Um, were hungry, busy, rural people really delighted to run around chasing after snails for 30 years straight? <laughs> it, it, it just didn't hold together. In any event, here's what I discovered. The original narrative about the campaign claimed that the party's phenomenal educational efforts effectively mobilize mass participation. Their mass work in turn eliminated the disease via disease prevention activities, mainly directed at eliminating snails. In other words, education and prevention were key. In contrast, 
I discover that both the educational and the prevention work were pretty ineffective. Um, instead, the campaign's success rested on the rarely mentioned treatment arm, which was carried out not by the masses, but by sent down urban doctors who provided expertise and local barefoot doctors who provided manpower and local connections. In addition, this book explores how the seemingly irrational and anti-scientific Maoist regime actually used a non-normative version of science to facilitate early power consolidation. Health campaigns were a primary mechanism to teach politically oriented scientific knowledge and practice. I examine how political consolidation, I'm sorry, scientific consolidation, a key but previously unexplored mechanism of control worked within this campaign and acted as a countervailing tendency to concurrent efforts at eliminating the bureaucracy. I discovered that the party used scientific rationales from health campaigns to achieve socialist construction goals in non-health arenas, as well as a way to address rural resistance. I'm currently working on two new books. One delves into the building deconstruction and rebuilding of the PRC's rural primary health care system. I'm exploring why, despite frequent attacks on expertise, consistent underfunding, and limited administrative capacity, it still managed to be fairly successful while also creating a fascinating new syncretic medical tradition. A second book is on the global COVID pandemic. The first half looks at why China initially hid the disease, what horrible impacts that had on citizens and health personnel, and finally, how the government turned it around to run one of the more successful campaigns in the world. The second half will compare and contrast three global approaches to disease control and their effects on both citizens and health providers. All right, so let me stop there. Thank you all so much for joining us in what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic and really interesting discussion. Thank you, Miriam. Let's move on to Alana. I'm not reached. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, and it's so nice to be here with all of these women. But I, I, I want to. I want to. Um, applaud you, Lynn, for putting together a panel like this in the middle of the COVID epidemic. Uh, so the last panel at the Fairbanks Center that I was on was actually one of the last panel, last events that the Fairbanks Center held in person. Uh, and apropos of the times, it was on what we were then calling the coronavirus. I don't think we had the name COVID yet. Um, and I've participated in a lot of panels on COVID and written a lot about COVID. Uh, you know, since I did that panel at the Fairbanks Center it was the end of February, uh, when we were then concentrating solely on China. Uh, this was this was an epidemic that many of us were seeing as SARS 2.0, and our expertise was being sought as you know experts on medicine and health in China. Uh, we were quickly forgotten about when the epidemic really became a global pandemic, moved into the shores of you know almost every country in the world, um, and has had a great impact on the on the U.S. Of course, um, and I think that the the mistake and the fallacy in that is that we forget that the response to infectious disease is not solely medical, clinical, or epidemiologic. Most of what goes into uh, spreading infectious disease and making something a global pandemic are you know, lessons that we can learn from history and sociology and anthropology. Uh, and so I really, I do, I commend you for bringing together a panel of, of, of infectious disease experts who may not necessarily work on, you know, COVID, right, or coronavirus, um, but know something about why, why a situation like this can emerge and, and sustain itself. And Miriam, I want you to know that I, I, I wish I had you with you yesterday. Um, I teach a course in 
called Global Pandemics. And yesterday's, yesterday's topic um, was about health communication. And I use your book to, uh, to these are, you know, they're, it's not a China course. Um, they're, uh, they're undergrad, it's an undergrad sort of health and policy type of course. Um, but I use your book to, to teach students you know, about sort of the, the, the weaknesses in health communication. Um, so I, uh, I'm an anthropologist and I will share a couple of slides now. I always forget how to do, do this share screen thing. Nope, that's not the right one. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right. Um, so I am an anthropologist and uh, my, most of my work has been on the HIV epidemic in China. Um, and as Ling mentioned, I wrote a book called Occupational Hazards, Sex, Business and HIV in Post Mount China, which is about the, the impact of gender and sexuality on infectious, sorry, I left out a U, uh, which is about the impact of gender and sexuality uh, on, on HIV in China, but also about the impact of governance on the HIV epidemic in China. Uh, we hear a lot about, you know, how gender and sexuality interact with HIV, but we rarely hear about how governance um, or bureaucracies affect, the, uh, affect HIV infection or, or, or other infectious diseases as well. Um, and this is really a book about how gender, sexuality, and governance all interact together uh, to, to affect the way the HIV epidemic developed in China, the way it the, the way it emerged, the way it developed, and the way and the way it was responded to. Why isn't that going away? All right. Um, so this is a scene that I think we're used to seeing in China. This was an old uh, karaoke bar that I don't think is open anymore. Um, it was part of the Great Wall Hotel, um, right? Other scenes that we're very, very used to seeing that I think we, we usually interpret in terms of, yeah, this is, you know, it's part of, it's sex work and it's just, you know, part of what goes on, it's part of masculinity. Um, but the way I examine it in, the, in, in my work and in the book um, is how, how this culture is part of a ritual uh, that fuels governance, right? It's part of the ritual that we call ying chou in China. And social, is a, it's a networking ritual um, that helps people build guanxi, helps them build the relationships that they need to advance in business and government. Uh, and without engaging in these types of activities, people don't advance in business and government. Business doesn't happen. In fact, uh, you know, when Xi Jinping took over in 2012 and he made an announcement that, you know, it's okay to have a banquet, but you should limit it to four dishes in a soup. Right, so it's high, get tongue, and the economy started to slow down a lot. No one, no one could sort of, you know, outwardly um, have these big banquets anymore. Um, the the global sales of Remy Martin went down by seventeen percent within the first few months of Xi Jinping's um, rule, and so this, you know, it has a it has a big impact on. Uh, on, govern on, on government, it has a big impact on, uh, on business. And there are a lot of government officials, you know, bus businessmen are dependent on government officials for getting the permits and allowances that they need to do what they do. Uh, a lot of government officials started saying, I'm not gonna do that anymore. What's in it for me? There's really not much in it for me. Um, and so what I often heard from people were sentiments like this, not in Renbu Piao Chang, a man who does not solicit prostitutes is offensive to the party central. And a woman who does not work as a prostitute is offensive to Zhurongji. Showing us really how integrated, um, you know, sex work and, 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 and things that make people vulnerable for HIV is 
with sort of the effective operation of governance in China. Um, so I, you know, I did this work just after the SARS epidemic. So SARS has always been something that was big in my mind. Um, one of the other things that we actually saw during SARS was sort of the halt of a lot of, you know, a lot of this, this, this network, a lot, a lot of the Ying Tou, because people couldn't come together. They had to, as we now know, social distance. Um, and there's a there's an anthropologist at Colby, Col Colby College who who wrote, an, who wrote a, a chapter for a book uh, on SARS at the time where she, she talked about a lot of jokes that were going around people's um, cell phones, te text messages at the time, you know, and there was this one joke that says something about how, you know, SAR, uh, 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 the, the party didn't stop, you know, prostitution, but SARS did. This party didn't stop carousing, but SARS did. Um, and it was really, you know, it was, again, it was, it was, it, it was a big sort of, you know, depression on what can happen at the time. Uh, so SARS has always been sort of big in my mind. And so when COVID, you know, when co the coronavirus happened, um, you know, again, I was thinking back, back to SARS. Um, and a lot of what I've, I've, I've written about and thought about um, over the past, what is it? It's 10 months now since January. Um, is really how the government uh, in China is affecting this current uh, epidemic. Um, th so this is actually, this is something that's gonna come out on Monday uh, in the conversation, um, but it's about how China beat the coronavirus, right, with science and strong public health measures, not just with authoritarianism. Um, yes, I do think that governance has, had a, has played a big part in why China has been able to beat the epidemic um, I think all, our government has also played a big part in why we've not been able to beat the epidemic. But China has shown since the SARS epidemic that it realizes the importance of public health and, and that it needs to prioritize public health. And I think, you know, we've been blaming or we've been, we've been attributing a lot of China's success to their authoritarian government. Um, and the point that, that, that this article will make is that it's not just governance. Um, it's your government's prioritization of public health as well. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, we have a great group of people and some really um, great topics to discuss. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Alana. So I think this last few lines Alana put out there bring us back to, not back actually, situate us in our current reality and all other pan panelists all point this out. We are in the pandemic and it seems like in the country we are living in or Mary in England, right? And we're going back to, well, England's going back to lockdown and our situation in United States in North America itself, it seems pretty bad too. So now the, re the, the things that's really interesting as Al Alana mentioned in January, in February, in March, we heard a lot about about China. And then increasingly, we heard more and more about how Asia, especially East Asia, many different regions, countries, they responded with extraordinary success. But now we are in November. As our crisis is coming back, third wave, third, fourth wave, it seems like we stopped talking about what, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in, Asia, uh, in, 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 in China, right? So can you please educate us a little bit more here? So what kind of issues in East Asia, in China, that we should look into in regard, in relation to, you know, outbreaks as the kind of outbreak we're dealing with? What kind of a deep histor uh, histor uh, uh, historical and anthropological, sociological issue that's so specific about, about China, about East Asia that we, we should look into, right? Uh, I can speak to that first, if that's possible. So um, I really love this because the facts on the ground really completely belie the racist assumption that this new coronavirus emerged because Chinese people are somehow less civilized or eat bats or whatever. Although that narrative, of course, speaking as a USer, is still very strong within certain white supremacist or unconscious racist uh, groups of people in the US, and it is still has a dangerous power. But for those of us who look at the facts, you can see very readily that Asian, uh, East Asian in particular societies across the board had a milder pandemic and have rebounded much more quickly. Um, and, and I think that the uh, commonly pointed 
uh, foundation in a Confucian society where care for others is important is a part of the story, but of course it's not all. So um, another issue is of course, as Alana was just saying, SARS. As a historian of medicine, I think the entire world should have learned this lesson a century ago with the absolutely deadly 50 to 100 million deaths, 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic. The lessons were already there. But so there is deep history, but people are ignorant of it. So the stronger influence is recent disease outbreak experience. For example, the Korean CDC was founded in 2004, directly out of the 2003 SARS experience. South Korea has done phenomenally. The government responded really rapidly in all protocols. Um, and so it's, it's more, I think, even though I'm a historian and I'm interested in deep history, I think it's recent history that lives in people's memories long enough to know that SARS normalizes the wearing of face masks. It uh, prepared the Chinese government, the other Asian governments to respond. And then, of course, MERS, H H1N1, all the other uh, recent disease outbreaks. Um. To jump off of that, I, I totally agree. I think SARS, but in Korea's case, particularly MERS, uh, when, um, when South Korea was chastised by the World Health Organization for its response to it, it really um, was a shocker. And I think one of the things that we see globally um, is that public health is not valued and it's not invested in. Um, and yet trying to madly invest and build up uh, institutional capacity in the mi mi middle of an epidemic is a disaster. And so I think that one of the things is not just that uh, SARS and MERS prepared uh, leaders to be proactive, uh, sort of got the population into the game um, and why not. It also made those countries focus on rebuilding and, and funding public health infrastructure and capacity, as well as developing extensive plans for when the crisis, the respiratory disease crisis or other disease crisis hit. Um, and I would also say that they realized, at least in South Korea, um, that the public health um, uh, leadership did not have enough power to get their words heard and their policies out. Uh, and so they actually raised uh, the power um, to a ministerial level and they thought about uh, how, how are we going to let these expert voices not just be heard, but have enough power to do anything. So that combination of investing in, in public health infrastructure and giving it enough power um, to maneuver in the society, I think also was really important. I'll, I'll add something to that. I'll just sort of jump off what, what Miriam was saying. Um, you know, we should mention Taiwan here as well. Uh, also learned from SARS uh, and had a very, very comprehensive plan. Uh, you know, they, 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 they built a comprehensive plan right after SARS. And as soon as they saw what was happening in Wuhan, they put that plan into motion. Uh, and it, that, that, that plan is still in motion today. You know, like Korea, Taiwan has not let up. Um, you know, and, and, and I do believe that another huge difference is the impact of the collectivism that you see in East Asian countries and the sort of horrible individualism that we see in our country. Uh, it's, I think especially, you know, we, we live in a very neoliberal society, but under the Trump administration, neoliberalism in the United States has gone amok. And I think it, I mean, it's, I, I, I just feel horrible that I've had to, I, I, have, I, I, have, I have had to pivot to a point where I have to say to myself, take care of myself, take care of my family, um, because my government is not going to. Uh, but what's, what's interesting to me is that, so we can't tell people to wear masks, right? So I live in Massachusetts, you live in Massachusetts, Ling, we see people wearing masks all around us, right? Nicole, you live in, uh, North Carolina, Miriam, I don't know what things are like in Oklahoma. I'm going to guess that they're slightly different from Massachusetts. Um, and I don't know what things are like in England, except for what I read in the newspaper. 
Um, but why can't I, why can't we tell people in the general public what to do, uh, wearing masks and, you know, making testing available for people, but on certain college campuses, we can. And again, I know the, the, I know the situation at, at Duke in Oklahoma is probably much different, um, but on college campuses in Massachusetts, and you probably know this, Ling, uh, students are tested twice a week. And if you're not, you're subject to disciplinary action. You must wear a mask indoors and out. If you don't, you're subject to disciplinary action. You must fill out a daily health assessment every single day and pick up your phone when you walk into a, you know, a class or a dining hall and show that you have you know, an, an app you know, that's green in color that, you know, that, that shows evidence that you've done all those things. I can do that on a college campus, which I understand is you know, a private um, compartmentalized environment, but I can't do that the way say it's done in China or, or Taiwan or Korea or, or even India, where they carry around the same kinds of apps, the public, you know, and I have a student who recently traveled from Shanghai to Changsha. And when she got back to Changsha, there had been, there had been a very, very small outbreak in, in Shanghai and her app turned red, which meant that she couldn't go out into Changsha and stay in a hotel, get onto an airplane, a long distance train or go into a public library. And that's how they keep those, that, that's how they're keeping the, the, this virus at bay in China, but we can't do that here. Mm -hmm. So um, Mary, if you um, don't want to jump in here, actually it's a fine because so I, I really wanted to push and we have a several other interesting questions. So if you can keep your thoughts, maybe building in others. So um, I just hope that we can move on so uh, we can get as many questions in as possible. So let me combine my next two questions to you together here. And I think actually um, both, uh, um, all of you have already touched upon this. We needed to be able to differentiate the acute outbreak and this extra extraordinarily dramatic like outbreak, you know, pandemic we're dealing with. And from the long-term medical conditions, the long-term historical conditions and the large social infrastructure um, and institutional context we're dealing with. And Miriam was right, right? We have to talk about all those institutions all, which requires a long time constructs, a long time of effort. So how about I ask you to bring your thoughts back to China, tell us a little bit about the interplay and perhaps the contestation between these two sides. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. I can just start uh, quickly. Um, I just wanted to note that one of the interesting things about this question is that the distinctions we may draw as historians and anthropologists and scholars between short and long-term epidemic responses may not be the same distinctions that um, the people that we are studying perceive, um, who are working with all kinds of different temporalities. And I think that may be a useful starting point. After all, think about today, things happen very fast over the course of about a week in March, and then suddenly things slowed down and time started doing very, very strange things, at least in my personal experience. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is Charles Rosenberg's dramaturgy of epidemics, this notion that epidemics have a set um, beginning um, kind of middle point where the epidemic is defined and then the process by which the epidemic is controlled followed by this kind of neat ending. Uh, a lot of historians like Dora Varga uh, also in the UK have done a lot recently to complicate the notion that epidemics ever have neat tidy endings. Um, and so I think that's important to kind of set out. Um, I think vaccination and the history of vaccination illustrates this rather nicely, given that, for example, in the Second Sino-Japanese War, vaccine drives were implemented in response to specific outbreaks of things like cholera um, in Yunnan in 1942. Um, and yet, over time, and especially, I think, in the 1950s, we see vaccination programs becoming long-term strategies for epidemic control, yet they are predicated on anticipation of the next epidemic, right? We were talking about the ways in which much more recently SARS 
um, experiences with SARS and MERS have um, provided these uh, formative experiences for uh, several policies in East Asia, um, thinking about the next respiratory illness. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting to think about the longer history of that, the way in which we see vaccine programs being implemented, again, with the anticipation um, of future short-term crises fund, uh, motivating uh, these longer-term interventions. Those are fantastic points. And I want to, in reaction to this question on the, the tension between epidemic crises and long-term strategies, I want to highlight what Miriam said in response to the first question, you know, that governments all over the world tend to underfund and under support public health systems that we know we have abundant evidence that that's what we need. Um, and so what's happened after SARS and across Asia and specifically in China is greater funding into public health structures and correlative to that giving granting greater authority to public health leaders. That's exactly what happened in the war period that my first book uh, covers, right? The, the effects were not as dramatic because let's face it, they were in a war with an invading army on the, their territory, but you did see, I think that's why you see the growth that I covered in, in my slides. Um, and the sad part of that is that, um, you know, it, to my analysis, it was largely women working as civilian and military nurses who, who pushed that growth because they were willing and able to do the almost completely voluntary work of actually getting public health services and, and military health services to the people. Much of that expertise, when it, the, the certain leaders like Zhou Meiyu who moved to Taiwan with the nationalist government, the KMT, they continued in the nationally funded National Defense Medical College. They had illustrious careers. Zhou Meiyu didn't die until she was 100 or, or older, worked in, in nursing. Taiwan became a global leader in nursing. They were hosting WHO, Western Pacific Region conferences in, nurse, uh, in nursing uh, as a profession. They were training leaders from around the world in Taiwan. Whereas in the mainland, the PRC state disbanded the Nurses Association, closed nursing schools, cl ceased publication of nursing journals, and smushed all of that energy that had been built up out of great, tremendous sacrifice. Um, I haven't yet done enough research to know exactly why. My suspicion is that the, the state wanted to grab and control that labor. So they wanted to be able to push it into the union clinics and later the barefoot doctors. And they didn't want the nurses to have their own authority and their own power to self-organize, which they had had in the war and they did continue to have in Taiwan. So I think a, another part of it is that states need to support but also back off <laughs> and give uh, enough autonomy to the people who are the experts to do that work. So um, I want to uh, jump in here and I'm speaking specifically about the Maoist era, so uh, 1949 to 76. And I think the, the larger point I want to make is that you really also have to look at the dynamics between the state and the locality. Um, and specifically, during that era, it was a rare era where at least during part of that period, the state was instead of functioning based off of scientific medicine, it was, it was really pushing something that's called state or social medicine, which believes that disease um, comes from a disordered environment uh, or, or stems from that rather than a pathogen, um, which the implications being do rural reconstruction and development to deal with diseases. Um, and so that was really a focus and, and the, this, the patriotic public health campaigns, which focused on environmental sanitation and hygiene, are just what you would hope in terms of, of, of focusing on building public health change and you know, per, changes in personal practice. The focus on prevention um, above treatment um, is just what you would hope from a state, and it's very rare that a state would be pushing public health as its primary uh, target. Uh, but, and here's the big but, that didn't necessarily carry out well at the bottom. Okay, um, that is, it made perfect sense that it was cost-effective to focus on prevention, 
But I can tell you that both from the archives that I've read and a bunch of in interviews with people in a variety of provinces, rural people never understood the concept of prevention in most places. They had a different etiology about diseases. Um, it didn't make sense to them to put energy and resources into, present, into trying to stop something that wasn't there. Um, the thing that they cared about was curing uh, you know, the child or the mom who was sick. And so any health resources they had where they had the autonomy to make a decision about it went into treatment. Um, and a lot of times um, these, um, these forced um, campaigns um, did not do high quality work. They focused on quantity over quality because people really didn't understand why they were forced to do this exercise. Um, and so I think that since the commune is deciding how it's spending its resources, um, it's given a choice. It's not uh, of uh, fully resourcing a lot of the public health work uh, and is resourcing um, what, whatever it can, a treatment and direct medical care. Um, so I think that we see this um, more broadly in the world that that even in the rare instance where you do have a government that um, that does premise this, you may not have citizenry or local officials who say this is worthy of funding uh, and support. Alana, do you have anything to add here, or we, we, you would like to move on to the next round of a question? We can move on to the next round. Fantastic. So I think um, um, some, in, to some extent, I think the, this 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 round of discussion already uh, brought up the um, uh, my what I would like to ask for you for uh, for the next question. This goes back to the state society relationship that, for instance, uh, Mary, you you began your presentation talking about, and also echoes with Alana's earliest point to this utmost significance to talk about a governance, right? So let's rest this for a little bit. I would like to push us to um, actually a different question. The acute, these outbreaks of pandemics, these momentary crises, um, they reveal the uh, often the ugly social reality, cultural reality, and also our sh very short attention span as a society, as a species, right? And, and all of you are scholars of uh, science and knowledge. And it's just really strange to think about how actually we are unable to remember, to think. So also these momentary disasters reveal the fundamental diseases and the flaw in our institution, in our daily, daily behavior. So I just want to for uh, push all of us to think a little bit about those uh, long existing flaws and the diseases and especially in relation to issues such um, will generate um, discrimination, alienation. So if I call out to several of the, uh, your studies, for instance, Alana, right, you study HIV disease, uh, other uh, other infectious disease, and those are disproportionately affects um, people working class in urban areas and Miriam, and we have to bring in non-human beings into this context, right? Non-human species being um, discriminated as a plague and uh, to be subjected Projected for eradication and a woman, definitely a huge story here. So tell us a little bit more about the historical evolution of those, you know, uh, uh, social diseases that eventually led to the outbreaks we are suffering right now. I'll, I'll start out this one. And I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, we definitely see that the outbreak of disease shows, you know, the cracks and fissures in our society, cracks that we don't necessarily notice as much um, until there's a disease that, you know, really sort of separates um, those in power from those who don't have power and shows why those who are in power um, can succeed. Um, you know, yeah, so, you know, it, 
we I think we really, really started noticing these things with the HIV epidemic, um, which is an epidemic that is framed around, you know, what public health calls high risk populations. So, you know, when, when we think about HIV, our minds immediately turn to drug users, right? And sort of, you know, the, the plight and sort of har how horrible, you know, drug users are, um, you know, pe how people think about them, right? You know, what, what sort of, um, what, what part of society um, they inhabit, sex workers, right? Um, and, uh, you know, hemophiliacs comes in, but, you know, uh, immigrants, right? Um, immigrants were always, you know, immigrants have always been blamed for infectious disease. Uh, this is not the first time, right? And we can go, we can go back, you know, in, in history um, and see how immigrants are marginalized by infectious disease as well. The, the, the other side of that is that when we create these paradigms of risk that are based on sort of what I call, or what anthropology calls constructed identities of drug users and sex workers, right? We're sort of, we're imposing these identities on people who may not, who may not embody them themselves. What we do is we, we, pro, we protect people. So we're trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to respond to people who, um, who are marginalized in society, but at the same time, we're protecting those uh, who, who you know who who inhabit the powerful parts of society? So you know, in my book, uh, I examine men, high, you know, high-powered men, businessmen, government officials, who are rarely seen as people who are vulnerable to HIV infection. You know, and why? Because they don't inhabit those spaces in society that we readily associate with HIV infection, and so they're protected. They're very much protected. Well, you know, if it weren't for the men, the women wouldn't have customers and the sex industry wouldn't exist. So why, why don't we, you know, why, why don't we focus on, 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 the, on the men who are their clients? So I think, you know, that's one of the spaces that we should start to examine is um, how our focus on marginalized vulnerable populations are actually protecting those who marginalize them. Um, I just wanted to maybe follow on in part because uh, some of the points that Elena made, I think, are really interesting about this question of um, not only who is being protected versus who is being blamed, but also the way in which this often ends up focusing on particular marginal groups. Uh, and you'd mentioned migrant groups. And it's really interesting to think about the long history of the ways in which within China, um, different ethnic groups have been stigmatized as carriers of disease and the ways in which that's become entangled with ideas about transmission and contagion of disease. So, um, you know, there are more recent precedents like in 1961 with the El Tor cholera pandemic, Fang Xiaoping has looked at how Indonesian Chinese become this uh, kind of center for concern and fear and stigmatization. But even earlier in the 1911 Manchurian plague that is so infamous at this point, I think, um, we see ethnicity playing a role in theories of that particular pneumonic plague's origins, uh, because most of the people who died uh, in Northeast China were migrant laborers from Shandong and Hebei. And so Crystal Slinteris has done a lot of work looking at how uh, there's this construction of epidemiological blame that targets those migrant hunters for, who have come to pursue the demand for fur and marmots. Um, and Chinese epidemiologists who, uh, like Wu Lianda, who believed marmots to be a major means of transmission, kind of pathologized these migrant peoples as um, people who didn't know to avoid sluggish or sick looking animals in contrast to the uh, Buryat hunters who, uh, who were, by contrast, quite skilled. Um, and so we see this way in which labors kind of embody this idea of, of contagious degeneration in ways that are really harmful individually in the short term for these poor people who are getting sick and often being sent to isolation hospitals that they're not probably going to come out of in 1911 in Northeast China. Um, but I think the way in which that gets caught up with questions of disease transmission, I mean, I think we see something perhaps similar today with the really horribly um, kind of overgeneralized and, and, and damaging conceptions of 
the kinds of transmission means that got COVID started. Um, so yeah, it's just really interesting to think of that particular way in which stigmatization gets attached to disease transmission. Um, I, I think these are really interesting points and they kind of drive at an enduring question for me that's at the heart of my current work, which is seeing from the US or the UK, it's possible to flatten China and think it's, you know, all Chinese live at the same sort of civilizational stratus, stratum, if you will. But of course, within China, there's a whole lot of different um, levels of the social hierarchy and farmers, rural residents, people who work in the soil have continually been on the bottom despite decades of communist policies. So those of us who study the communist state can easily point to all of the policies of that state that actually worked to keep those people down at the bottom, ironically, in the, the socialist state. Um, but I, I suspect as a cultural historian that there's something deeper here. And I think that the discrimination of urban peoples against those who live in rural areas and work in the soil and sometimes get that dirt of the soil on their physical selves really sits very, very deep and is one of the enduring reasons for the fact that those people are still subject to civilizational programs and schemes that are very pedantic. And there's, you know, this was happened in the, under the nationalist state that was basically pseudo fascist ultra rightist and it happened under the communist state that's ultra leftist. So there's something going on here that has nothing to do with state policy. It's an enduring prejudice, right? And we all know as um, historians and anthropologists of medicine that those en enduring kinds of prejudices often get attached to physical states of illness. But I think that they um, also have a lot of strength even when there's a total absence of disease state, if such a thing were ever to exist. <laughs> yes, I, I think those are, are great points, Nicole. And I, I just want to say that I think that there is a hierarchy of value and resourcing that is attached to all of this. Um, so not only do you under-resource rural areas because the, those bodies are much less um, worthwhile than urban bodies, but you also um, change the nature of your healthcare um, in rural areas, uh, you may focus on accessibility and affordability, but you um, feel no need to get expertise out there. Uh, because they're, they're um, you know, just plain folks with bottom level diseases and why do they need expertise? And that's a trend that continues to this day. But then even within rural communities, there's a very strong hierarchy of value there. So the, the young, um, um, the youth, particularly uh, male youth, uh, are the top of the society. And so whatever resources that rural community has is mainly going to be invested in keeping them at the top of their game. Um, and everyone else in terms of resourcing or even access um, goes way down. Women uh, mainly get care in terms of childbirth, but not in terms of wider uh, issues, and perhaps one of the most neglected groups um, are the elderly, um, who, um, who utterly no get, get, don't get resources. And even in famous mass campaigns, um, uh, people above 60 are not treated, and um, in general, they're excluded um, from treatment campaigns, because why should we even bother with them? They're at the bottom of the hierarchy, uh, both uh, both in terms of productivity, but also as feudal remnants who were happy to, to let go. And so these hierarchies of value are not just, um, uh, in, you know, embedded, you know, biases and prejudices, but are distinctly linked um, to resourcing and uh, strategies um, of public health and medicine. I want to very quickly echo speaking as a pre-modern historian, listening to this around the discussion, I found it fascinating. And so um, the perceptive uh, stigma, how they build into uh, discriminatory strata uh, hierarchy. And if we move into pre-modern period, moving to time period I work on 11th, 12th century, as early as that, that time, we can see their existence as well, such as soil, 
dirt phobia. It was a widespread disease among uh, literati scholar, scholarly officials, right? So, so this means our work, your work, right? The in-depth historical and anthropological research to build up longer term, large context and a multifaceted analysis is a far more, I think, in urgent demand in comparison with our collective, you know, anxiety about this particular moment. Can we survive today, right? We need to be able to go back in deep time, go back in broader context. So I really appreciate with your all your uh, insights here. I do have many thoughts, questions I want to ask, but I should uh, stop here. We should allow our wonderful audience to put in their questions. So can I encourage us to go around, uh, go through these questions? So here, let's begin with the first one. I believe our panelists can see from Levy's Leave It. How did China build a population trust after initial suppression of information about COVID-19? Or people now trust Chinese government statistics? <laughs> Please. I'll just say very briefly, I, I don't think from uh, my perspective, the people I've talked to have a lot of uh, have absolute concrete trust in government statistics. They know this, the government lies when it comes to statistics, but they do have trust, faith in the structures that the government puts in place, and then they trust each other and all of the structures that have come out of the social media and the voluntary groups to, to care for each other, and they trust their own networks. Um, so I think that's adequate trust in the Chinese case, but I do also want to point out that I think probably public trust is highest amongst East Asian states in Vietnam. And Vietnam is notably has the lowest disease burden and lowest mortality. And that's because it has focused from the very beginning on very, very open, transparent communication with the public. And that's, wow. a, a, they're a shining exemplar. Oh. Yes, uh, very briefly, uh, I agree. I don't think everybody trusts, but I do think that they have observed, at least in China, a typical response, which is there's um, mass suppression of information, denial, the government figures out a plan, and then it does a massive top-down, organized, and very effective, and in China's case, um, uh, very stringent campaign. And that has been that model of the government doing a massive um, top down campaign is, I think, situated in people's memory as the way to deal with public health crises. I mean, they've been taught since the Maoist era that that's how you do it. That, and so once the, the government implements their mass campaign rollout, uh, they know the government is on the case and is acting, and they settle back and let the, the, the campaign roll out. Um, so actually, the more stringent and top-down it is, the more you can relax because all the signs are in that the government is going to take control of this. I'll, I'll add something to what Nicole was saying. You know, I think a lot of the mistrust that happened uh, in this epidemic was a result of what happened during SARS. That we saw huge cover-ups for a very long time during SARS. Um, you know, as Nicole has mentioned, SARS is something that is still in the recent memory of the Chinese populace, which I think is actually pretty amazing. I can't imagine that our attention span in the US would go back even 17 years. Certainly did not go back a century. Um, but you know, we have a hard time keeping HIV under control in the US and that's an epidemic that still does go on, but yet, yet we've stopped teaching our children about it. Um, so, and I, and, I, and I think that the impact from SARS had a very, it, it had this lingering effect. Um, and being that this was the same type of, of virus, I, I, I think that people started out with the initial impression that we can't trust the government. Despite the fact that I think, you know, obviously the Chinese government acted much quicker and was much more transparent in this instance, um, sequencing the genome of, of the virus very quickly and getting it out into, you know, the, into the international 
um, journals very, very quickly. Um, and I, so it was hard to, to start out with trust. Um, and I think that, you know, another impact on sort of building trust amongst the populace at this point was, came, came from social media. Social media didn't exist in the SARS era. And so it was difficult to create these, for lack of a better term, viral um, types of response or responses that went viral. It was much easier to do that, um, you know, 10 months ago, 11, eight months ago, um, you know, with, with, with the impact of WeChat um, and with the ability to, to, to get vitriolic messages out around the world within 10 seconds. Uh, that, you know, sort of re really fed upon itself and I think made it harder for the government to build up trust no matter what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we have to get through a lot more questions so I'll try and keep it <clears throat> as brief as I can, but um, I think one of the really interesting uh, things, uh, one of the interesting images that came out of recent uh, months was the photos that emerged of uh, Chinese medical teams sending aid to Northern Italy and other places around the world. And mm -hmm. it's been really interesting to think about how Chinese medical diplomacy um, in terms of sending PPE or other forms of, of uh, aid, that has a history, I think, um, that goes back mm -hmm. Um, quite a while. Um, but there are also interesting questions about the, the way in which that was foreign facing, but also domestically uh, oriented or that that had a domestic audience. Um, and so in terms of building mm -hmm. um, population trust, I don't know if this exactly gets at that, but it certainly suggests ways in which uh, one, uh, if you're browsing your social media and you see all these pictures of China um, being competent enough that it has all this extra PPE to donate to Western countries that have not managed the pandemic, mm -hmm. then I think that sends a fairly powerful message and it's one that's interesting to contemplate. Um, but I'll pause there. Yeah, so um, I noticed we have a 10 more minutes to go, very precious 10 minutes, but we have a many wonderful questions. I'm just gonna um, ask us to speak up, uh, to speed up a little bit. So I'm, I'm looking at the second question and I think maybe Mary would like to jump in. This is particularly because of concerning vaccination programs. <laughs> Where does yeah. China stand this year, 2020? What would be the meaning of early, not yet proved vaccine programs of uh, mass vaccination. So um, other panelists, if you have uh, the ideas of jump in, please, but just let's uh, hopefully we can cover more questions. Yeah, again, very, very quickly. I mean, I think today the figure reported was something like 1 million people who have already received um, an inactivated COVID-19 vaccine from Sinopharm. Um, the uh, National Vaccine and Serum Institute in Beijing claims to have finished building the world's largest vaccine production facility with uh, estimates of 100 to 120 million doses a year. Um, I think, you know, there are lots of questions to ask about uh, those points, but the fact that people have gotten a vaccine that has not finished phase three testing and they appear to have lined up outside uh, mm -hmm. kind of centers to, to get that vaccine um, perhaps indicates the degree to which there is um, at least uh, a certain degree of um, acceptance of vaccination in the population today. I'm really hesitant to make any very strong claims here because I think there's just a lot that I certainly don't know yet. Um, but I think it does speak in a really interesting way to how vaccines are often conceptualized as technological solutions to issues that often have vast social and political dimensions. I'll stop there before I go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any any thoughts on particular question before we move on? Okay, wonderful. And I think this actually related to the previous question about the issue of trust, right? Why would people line up to get those um, yet 100% approved the vaccine? So this is very interesting. Let's move on to the third question. So from Michael Hathaway, fascinating discussion, everyone. I was just stuck with Miriam's dis description of a Maoist state's a particular theory of a dealing with public health. Can all the panelists speak somewhat to change changing paradigms and theories of a public health in China from the Republican era until now. Are we talking about three to five major shifts over time? Uh, for instance, were, the, were there strong shifts during the Mao era and so forth? So the, this is a huge question. So panelists. <laughs> 
I'll take a brief stab first, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can put a quantity on it, but one shift that I note between the nationalist state period and particularly the period of war, World War II, uh, with J Japanese invasion, and then later the Maoist state presiding over a period mostly of peace, although they said soldiers to Vietnam and Korea. Um, and then there was the ongoing civil war with Taiwan, but it was largely a peaceful time. Uh, public health uh, specialists in the war period tried to tell central government officials, okay, we're having some success with keeping young children alive, keeping infants alive, keeping mothers alive after they have give birth, giving people vaccines, preventing diseases. So we're going to have a public, a, a population crisis <laughs> if we don't put the brakes on. And the government's impl implementation of the one child policy really going um, in the late seventies, although I know Miriam's work problematizes the timeline on this, was a belated response to that and classically authoritarian, right? But the um, attempt to control the population to first keep people alive and then make sure they didn't have too many children <laughs> so that there weren't too many people um, is one really interesting shift that when you look at the granular level had really profound implications for people's lives and particularly the lives of childbearing women. Um, that I think is notable. Mm -hmm. I will actually, I would like to jump in very, very quickly. We have only a few minutes, but we have many questions. Can I encourage our panelists to go through? Can you see the questions? Can you please look at this, the next several questions from uh, Shu Nan Yu, uh, Yu Yo, uh, Amanda Schumann, Susan Greenhall, um, Juliet Tempest, and anonymous attendee. Would you mind to take a quick look and pick a question you would like to answer so we can cover as much as possible? Oh, you need to read the question when yes. you, uh, yeah, <laughs> otherwise the, the, the audience does not know. Okay, who would, would like to pick a question too? I, I was just looking at the last question and it really struck me. Okay. Um, and it really, you know, it, it 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 speaks to these cracks and fissures in society that are uncovered by by a pandemic like this. Um, can you, know, can you uh, read read oh, quickly sorry. read the question? <laughs> um, so I the the uh, questioner says I recently read Dr. Marta Hansen's article entitled "From Sick Man of Asia to Sick Uncle Sam." which argues that the image of the United States has been rendered invalid by the government's sloppy response to the epidemic and broader social issues. I wonder to what extent do you think this metaphor constitutes a broader discourse of weakness for American society or what differences do you see in the comparison between sick man of Asia and sick uncle Sam? Um, so, you know, right, the China was considered the sick man of Asia, um, you know, when the, when, when the, um, when the PRC took over, when the CCP took over, um, because of right all the all 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 the epidemics that were rampant in China, um, and the historians here obviously know what was done to um, to rid China of those epidemics, and there were there were these you know massive top down campaigns that the government uh, engaged in because they knew that you know by making the the, the population healthy that was a way to to strengthen the nation. Um, and I think what we've, what we've seen, you know, and, and that's, that, that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why they've, why they came out so strongly against this epidemic. Uh, and I think, you know, what we've seen in the United States is we, while we thought we were a strong nation, um, we were really very, very vulnerable to any, any type of, you know, sort of, any type of rattling of our society, um, th th which, which, which shows that we weren't actually that strong, which shows that you know we were on the we were on the brink of of, of collapse, um, you know, and so you know at at just sort of the the, the littlest rattling, um, we've seen huge amounts of unemployment, um, you know, huge lines at food banks. And again, you know, because you know, because we're such because neoliberalism, I think, has gotten so just you know we we we've always been a neoliberal society, but because it's become so much stronger 
under the Trump administration, um, we don't see any type of collectivist effort to, you know, to, to, to help the to help the, the situations that have arisen from this epidemic. Right. And I can see the clock are ticking and I'm afraid Mary has to go soon. But Mary, would you like to uh, choose a question and help our audience here before you leave? Oh, thank you. Um, I'll try and stay as long as I can. Um, so uh, I noticed there was a question about animals and uh, I'll read it out. Professors uh, Reselton and Gross have mentioned a focus on animal hosts of disease among public health actors, marmots in 1911, snails in the Maoist era. Could you speak more to the role of animals in historical Chinese public health imaginaries? Um, and uh, I think that there is so much to say about this and I'll leave snails for Miriam, uh, the world expert, uh, but I've, I've just been fascinated by how so many commentaries have really highlighted the role of multi-species entanglements as they're thought of in causing the current situation, but also previous epidemics. So this question of, I think it's uh, John May who's described them as transgressive connections between the habitats of wild animals and the bodies of, of middle-class consumers that have resulted in epidemic calamity. Um, and those are quite recent. And yet I think there are longer histories to be traced of identification of certain animals as disease transmitters. Yet at the same time, I think one of the really interesting things about public health and public health research in 20th century China is that we've seen it stress epidemic control in livestock and other kinds of animals alongside uh, ep epidemic control in humans. And so I look at epidemic prevention research where uh, horses and guinea pigs and rabbits to the extent that you can get them, mm -hmm. which is always up for grabs. Those are, those are things that are really quite central um, in terms of the material work of, of research and of thinking about public health. Um, and one of the really interesting questions I think is how we see, and I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but thinking about the post-socialist trans transition, how that brings to bear new policies of farming and what's been called wildlife farming, I think, um, and the ways in which that results in new kinds of interspecies entanglements of the kind that have occupied so many uh, minds recently. So I think for me, it's that notion of that. It's not only about the way in which they transmit disease, but also in which they actually are part of research systems to um, address um, those uh, diseases and epidemics. Um, and I think that's really fascinating. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make just a few minutes a stretch to allow Miriam and Nicole to choose a question to, um, to interact with our audience. Mm -hmm. Or, um, I guess um, I, I I can t try and take a bit of a stab at um, Dr. Greenhall's uh, question about skipping to the bottom here. Um, what do we know about the limits and biases of the statistics and scientific story being told about COVID by the PRC state today? And how can we trust what the Chinese state tells us about the control of COVID now? Um, and I, I would say that um, um, one of the major in investments in um, post-SARS was in, in transforming um, the sort of disease prevention system into CDCs um, with high-end labs um, and um, a, a lot of um, data capacity and the investment in this mega um, um, surveillance um, reporting system. We also know that most of the people from Wuhan um, basically did not participate in that reporting system in the beginning, um, but they had to wait until it was decided by the government that um, that, it, that it was okay and that they were dealing with this. So, um, but to cut to the chase here, I, I think that the numbers that come out of China um, are not tr trustworthy for many political and other reasons, but I actually think that the Chinese government, um, between its investment in high-end science and statistical uh, work, as well as training people up in this, is actually collecting fairly good data. It's just not sharing it with anyone. So I think that you see an extremely careful data-driven approach by the Chinese government 
while none of that information is getting out. Um, um, but I, but I, but what you don't, I mean, so I actually think the data is actively being gathered and is quite accurate, um, but hidden and will remain hidden. But it, that, that ability to collect process uh, data and to target what the government is doing is one of the things accounting for the PRC's sustained success at dealing with this problem. Nicole? Sure, um, I'll just briefly start by saying that uh, what Miriam Gross just said addresses to some extent Shunan Yo's question about should China, when and how should China move from a wartime crisis state, state to you know, a different model for managing small outbreaks. Probably not until there is a vaccine widely available because you never know when it's gonna slip from small isolated cases to larger ones, particularly if they are using, and I agree with Miriam that they got all the data. Um, but I'd like to speak to Amanda Schumann's question about there have been a few articles about COVID and Qigong and herbal treatments. So what is the role of so-called traditional Chinese medicine in public health in China? That question is way too large to answer, but has there been an urban rural divide and how does it fit into understandings of medicine today? Um, I can't necessarily say that there is a distinct urban rural divide in use of Chinese medicine, but I would say that, you know, there's both government statistics saying that in something like 85% of COVID cases, use of Chinese herbal remedies in particular remedies therein, particularly one that clears the lungs and expels pathogenic um, materials is uh, highly useful and uh, decreases the amount of time people need for recovery. Um, but there's really interesting stuff that you don't have to scratch very far to look for and find um, publications and scientific artic articles on the use of integrated medicine. And I think that's what we're seeing more that is speaks to the value, the enduring value of Chinese herbal treatments and Chinese medical approaches and etiology. Although it's never, almost never, even in clinical and hospital settings in China used solely or exclusively. It may be used exclusively by certain individuals in homes, but not in a, a kind of state supported or government supported institution. But it does, um, I believe that there are, uh, there is a tremendous value in Chinese uh, medical approaches. And I'm going to myself my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. And I would like to quickly say, you know, actually, um, back in March, my family in China sent me a huge box of a after paying a lot of money of Lianhua Qingwen Jiaonang, <laughs> the famed Chinese herbal medicine tablets. So I still have, I have never taken them. They're still there. I have tons. So any of you, if you for research purpose, for entertainment purpose, if you want to get some, let me know. I have tons of them. So with this note, I would like to thank all our audience for your participation. And uh, uh, please join me, audience, to thank our wonderful panelists. I feel really bad. Um, I have to rush all of you say, hey, finish, finish, let's move on. But actually, there was a, such a rich, diverse conversation. I think all this panel deserves three hours to elaborate on, you know, many more um, the issues in a more um, uh, elaborate way. So I appreciate your participation, your contribution of time to spend this time with us. And it gave us this rich understanding of historical dimension and anthropological, sociological logical dimension underneath the pandemic we are facing. So for audience, I encourage you follow these brilliant scholar. Elena has an article coming out and you showed us, right, about your discussion about governance and authoritarian in regard to COVID-19. Everybody check out the article. And then Miriam has a book project about COVID-19. So that's something everybody have to have to read. And again, new book from Mary about vaccination. This will be the topic for 20, the rest of 2020 and 2021. So everybody should know about that. And Nicole has a huge question, right, coming out of her award-winning book. And especially for many people in the audience, many people working on women issue, working on gender issues, sexuality, and uh, you need to check out these wonderful women scholars in this panel. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. I really appreciate your participation. Okay, now I'm gonna 
ask the audience to kick themselves out <laughs> so we can get one more minute quiet time to just to wind down for one minute thank you for your participation thank you Ling.